Yeah, welcome everybody uh, to the second talk of this uh, afternoon session. And the speaker is uh, Professor Adriano Campbell Bagata, and he is a uh, professor, I think, in the physics department of uh, University of Alicante, uh, Spain. The and his his expertise is on the internal structure. I mean, he he does uh, n bodies. Um, I would say, uh, I will let him explain to you. But then he he specialized in in studying the the gravitational uh, agglomeration of many uh, uh, small bodies, and then the, which is um, very suitable to study the internal structure of, of small asteroids, which we know that they are kind of rubble pies because of previous uh, collision uh, process in the in the past. Uh, then we always have a question: Why why the uh, asteroids are say larger than one kilometer? They cannot uh, rotate. Uh, with a period uh, smaller than 2.2 hours, uh, because those asteroids, even though rubble pies, they could have a different porosity, could have a different density. However, they seem to have a share the same spin cutoff. When, 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 when should say that? So I think that's a one. <laughs> I think I have asked up a Professor Gumbo Pagata this question before, and I want to I look forward to your answer. Okay, mm -hmm. please. Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ip, for inviting me to to give this this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure and a honor for me to 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 give this talk at, uh, at the TSU Institute. And I wish I was there in person, but maybe in the future, who knows, uh, I will be able to to travel to uh, to Taiwan. So the topic of my talk is the internal structure, especially of small asteroids. Uh, so I will make a short introduction to the small bodies of the solar system with a special attention to asteroids and tell about the expected internal structure of asteroids and what is the evidence for the existence of gravitational aggregates of, or, or with the most common terminology rubble piles and then i will talk to uh, with uh, about numerical modeling of the internal structure and in particular i will focus on the uh, work that is carried out at the university of alicante at our group uh, and i just shortly tell about uh, the space missions that are uh, being programmed to uh, unveil the small bodies inside so let's start with the small bodies of the solar system what you see here is uh, the two uh, the, uh, two of the largest asteroids in the main belt which are Ceres and Vesta and uh, they are compared to the size of the moon in this view graph you see they are in the hundreds of kilometers size range and uh, this is how we we see them now but we have to remember that asteroids were discovered in 1801 but it was not until the end of the 80s this century uh, excuse me last century that uh, we were able to start to envision what the shape of asteroids were when the first uh, radar images were available and then it was in 1991 when the first asteroid was actually pictured by a spacecraft. So it's a knowledge on the uh, that opened a new era of knowledge about the uh, how asteroids are in their uh, overall appearance. They stopped to be just small points of light in the sky and having just the photometry and spectroscopy uh, to characterize them. Now we are in an era in which we can really see their shapes. Okay, so, um, but um, we are not going to talk about these big guys because they are intended to be um, uh, differentiated with the core, mantle, and the crust. And we are rather in, more interested in in scaling down this, this range and go to the tens of kilometer size range where it is no longer possible to have internal differentiation. So here you see some of the asteroids and some of the comets uh, and uh, the comet Halley. Here you see the comparison with the 
with the uh, size of Vesta just uh, uh, showing up on the uh, on the right uh, uh, down right corner and the TNO arrow code on the left. So these objects are already very irregular. We don't expect to have uh, differentiated structures there. But we can even go down to a few kilometer size. And then we have still more uh, asteroids on the right. And we have already spotted a lot of comets here, on, on especially on the left. And finally, uh, scaling even down, we are in the, in the realm of, of, of uh, a few hundred meters uh, size asteroids, like the asteroids, uh, asteroid Bennu that was visited by the uh, NASA spacecraft uh, Osiris Rex, and the uh, asteroids Itokawa and Ryugu that were uh, visited by uh, spacecrafts uh, Hayabusa 1 and 2. And you can see here on the uh, uh, left hand corner uh, a, a, a piece, a, a, just a, a, a small piece of the of the 67P comet just to, to put the whole thing in, in, in context. Okay, so these asteroids have very strange uh, shapes uh, of any very different kind. Uh, what can we, uh, what do you, do we expect to find for in their internal structure? First of all, let me remind you that uh, all these asteroids, even the ones that now we see close to the Earth, the so-called near-Earth asteroids, all those asteroids live or have lived in the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt is a region of the solar system in, uh, which is in a somewhat uh, limited volume in between the orbits of Mars and, and Jupiter with high inclinations and eccentricity. And that makes that their relative velocities are very high. High to the point that the average uh, encounter velocity is on the order of six kilometers per second. That means that uh, this is a collisional system. It is a system in which all its uh, their elements uh, can collide and can uh, at high with high energy and can be uh, smashed. There is another uh, collisional uh, system in the in the, uh, in the in the solar in the solar system. It's the one made by the uh, uh, Trojan asteroid that you can see here in the view graph. Um, uh, which are uh, we are which are sharing the, the the orbit of Jupiter because they are in the uh, equilibrium point L4 and L5 of the three body problem uh, re reduced three body problem problem Jupiter Sun and uh, asteroid but there is still another collisional system that is the uh, Transneptunian region or Edgeware Kuiper Belt where uh, we think that this is the the source of the um, or the uh, of the comets that we see uh, in our in our uh, close close to to the sun, and uh, this uh, collisional system is somewhat uh, a larger extension of of of, uh, of space uh, that is reaching from beyond the the orbit of Pluto up to uh, some forty seven uh, astronomical units, but a lot of other bodies are uh, lurking around there. And velocity, relative velocities are somewhat smaller than in the asteroid belt. So what happens when two asteroids collide? Okay, this depends pretty much on the energy. We can go from a cratering regime where you just excavate some mass, but the overall structure is intact. We can, we can go with uh, uh, cracking uh, the target by subcatastrophic events. Then there may be many cratering events that have a, the, the effect to propagate the uh, shock wave in, inside, the, inside the, the body to such an extent that they produce fragments, but that they don't uh, produce uh, disordering of those fragments. If we increase the energy, we can have shattering of the target and uh, reaccumulation by self-gravity. 
And even some of the ejecta may be uh, rubble piles. Then we can have, if we, we, if we have more energy, we can have shattering and gravitational reaccumulation. And here we can have many different levels of damage in the in the remaining uh, uh, in the remaining in the largest uh, fragment produced. And at the top of this uh, of this uh, energy scale, uh, we have the dis completely disruption of the target. So we have a whole range of energies for which we can have different uh, outcomes, and some of those outcomes result at least from the theoretical point of view in the reaccumulation into a gravitational aggregate or rubble pile. So unfortunately, the mass and the shape distribution of asteroid components is completely unknown because uh, I saw I said before that we are in the era of the uh, discovering new shapes of, of asteroids, but we are just starting to envision the era in which we, we, we are able to really understand what is the internal structure of asteroids by means of spacecraft. So what we have is laboratory uh, experiments like the like these ones that you can see here, where we shatter a, 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 a basalt target or whatever material, and we, we uh, collect all the fragments and we measure the mass distribution. And in some cases we did in 2013, also the, um, also the shape distribution of those fragments. We can plot the, those in a, in, a, um, in, in such a way that we can derive the um, the uh, cumulative size distribution, mass distribution, and the exponent of this mass distribution is related to the largest fragment of the of the uh, of the shattering event. And I will show you in a in a minute. So this uh, largest fragment, which is this FL, which is related to the to, to the slope of the size distribution of the fragments produced is a, 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 um, the, the ratio of the largest fragment uh, over the uh, mass of the, of the whole target. And it depends on a number of uh, characteristics of the collision, like, like is the uh, shattering specific energy of the collision, the energy of the collision, and the mass of the target. So in this way, we can, um, we, we can find what is the uh, shutter threshold specific energy for any kind of material and uh, but this is not enough in a, in an asteroid environment because of course we, we have gravitation so we have to also define another uh, kind of uh, specific energy and this, this is the specific energy for disruption which is the uh, energy that is uh, enough to uh, shatter and disperse at least 50 percent of the target this is the difference. You can shatter here on the left, you can shatter a target and produce the largest fragment that can be uh, at, uh, at the minimum 50% of the mass of the target. And here we have gravity where you can have 50% uh, uh, of the remaining largest fragment, which is made by uh, an aggregate of small fragments. And, uh, Starting from this and from theoretical studies, we can derive what we call scaling laws for fragmentations. I mean, this, these uh, experiments were made at laboratory uh, scale, but of course we want to know what happens at asteroid scale. So in mean, this way we can, uh, we can derive what is the specific energy for fragmentation both in the gravity regime and in the shot and in the uh, strength regime. That is both when the gravity starts to be important, that is uh, beyond uh, a few hundreds of meters and below that. Okay, finally, uh, we will uh, have the first uh, experiment in space uh, after uh, the one that was made on 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 on, on comets by the um, uh, deep impact missions, um, the first experiment in space on a on an asteroid, which is the DART uh, uh, mission that will impact uh, asteroid uh, Dimorphos, the satellite of the uh, binary system Didymos, 
on September 26th, which is uh, essentially 97 days uh, away. So we studied the uh, collisional evolution of the asteroid belt uh, in the past and also on the, of the uh, trans-Neptunian belt. And, and one of the uh, questions that we wanted to answer to uh, was how many gravitational aggregates, how many rubble piles are in the small body population. In this work, uh, it is already a little bit old, but it's still uh, probably the only one that is uh, uh, giving an estimate of what is the amount of gravitational aggregates as a function of size. We found that uh, in the range five to 100 kilometers, more than 60 to 80% uh, of uh, main belt asteroids should be gravitational aggregates. So essentially what we also find is that uh, there is no chance that a small object of a few, ki of a few tens of kilometers is a, a primordial object. The situation is a little bit different for the uh, collisional evolution of the trans-Neptunian belt, so uh, what happens for comets. Uh, here, uh, there is a relatively uh, few percentage of TNOs in the range of 30 to 100 kilometers that may be a uh, gravitational aggregate, unless there is a, uh, a very, very slow, uh, low strength, uh, material strength in, in, in those objects. Okay, so uh, depending on the origin, uh, we can, we can we can derive what is the structure of the of these asteroids. If the origin is planetesimal formation, what we have is a structure that is differentiated, I, as I showed you in the first view graph, and the size should be larger than a few uh, tens of kilometers or at least 100 kilometers. Then if we have fragmentation by multiple low energy collisions, then we could have an object that is cracked with no jolting. Um, and uh, kept together probably by uh, friction forces. And this is in the range of between three kilometers and some tens of uh, kilometers. Uh, in, uh, in an even smaller regime, including the, 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 the former regime, uh, we have post-impact reaccumulation. That is, we have gravitational aggregates. And we, here we, we need a small co cohesion by friction force to keep together these, these bodies. This is the case of Itokawa, or the, or the primaries of asteroid binaries, and so on. And this is in the range from two, three hundred meters to below a few tens of kilometers. Then we have the smaller size, the smaller size below 200 meters, where, where we find very fast rotators. And these are probably single fragments uh, ejected uh, by collisions in the asteroid belt. And these are essentially monolithic asteroids, unless uh, we accept the hypothesis that uh, these objects can be made by dust aggregates kept together by intermolecular forces. And we will back to that again uh, in the next slides. So, but what is the evidence? That was a sort of theory, but what is the evidence for gravitational aggregates? How do we know there are gravitational aggregates beyond our theoretical and numerical considerations? So uh, there are many reasons. It's, it's, it's the existence of the binary asteroids, which may be formed by fission, mass shedding, reaccumulations, is due to the rotational periods that don't normally overcome the spin barrier 2.2 uh, hours, implying little or no coherence in the structure. The observation of chains of craters on planets and, sa and satellites, plus the observation of, Sh of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 that <laughs> Uh, plunged into the uh, Jupiter's atmosphere uh, 30 years ago. But let me start with the most compelling evidence, that is the bulk density of asteroids. Asteroid estimated densities are smaller than their meteorite analogs. So that implies voids in the internal structure, which means that they are made by, by multiple components. What does that mean in, 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 more, uh, in a more... Uh, concrete sense. So here we, we see asteroid Matilde, which is an asteroid of about 50 kilometers in size with an estimated bulk density of 1.3 uh, grams per uh, cubic centimeter, while its um, 
meteorite analog is, is a carbonaceous chondrite, which density is around 2, 2.5 grams per uh, centimeter cube. There is something that doesn't match here. The same thing uh, happens for uh, asteroids like Itokawa. Itokawa is a um, 500 meter uh, asteroid on its longest axis, and uh, its bulk density is 1.9 grams per centimeter cube, and its meteorite analog is the ordinary chondrite, and uh, its density is beyond 3 grams per cubic centimeter. So there's some mismatch here between the um, meteorite uh, analog and the estimated uh, density of asteroid that I will try to explain in, in a minute. So here we have a, you have a table of the um, asteroid estimated density and uh, on the left you have the type of the asteroid and, uh, and you have the density of the asteroid at different levels of, of uh, uh, precision measurement uh, in, the, in the column that you see here. And here you have uh, the density for meteorite, uh, different kinds of meteorites from ordinary chondrites to carbonaceous chondrites and stony and iron chondrites. So um, comparing these two uh, tables, we can see that for S-type, objects, the porosity, typical porosity, if we take the best available uh, measurements, is around 28%, even with a large uh, error bar. And this, um, um, and this has to be compared with ordinary contracts. Instead, in the case of the C-type asteroids, we have a larger porosity of about 42%, and this has to be compared with the porosity, with the density of the carbonaceous contracts. So what's happening here? Okay, uh, what is porosity? Porosity may be of different kinds. If this is a representation of a gravitational aggregate and we take into account one of its uh, components, um, we can compare the material density with the meteorite analog density. But this involves a lot of small uh, flows, uh, intergrain space, cracks, and, the, and a lot of uh, irregularities inside the component. That is part of what we call microporosity, which is porosity at the low scale uh, range. Instead, if we look at the voids between the different uh, components, then uh, this is what the, the constituent part of what we call macroporosity, which is porosity of the overall objects as a whole. So the two quantities are easily uh, easily uh, work, work out um, with this simple operation. We can have porosity as one minus the uh, bulk density d d divided by the density of the fragment, or if we accept the analog. Uh, the meteorite analogs, this density of the meteorite analog. So from this, we can have what is the porosity of the uh, gravitational aggregate. Um, so um, asteroids, uh, most asteroids are probably gravitational aggregates, but there are different kinds of a gravitational aggregate. For instance, we have here asteroid Eros on the left with 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. This is an S-type asteroid. So its meteorite, meteorite uh, analog is uh, an ordinary chondrite. And it, uh, the, um, the, um, the um, spacecraft that visited this asteroid uh, found that uh, or measured that this can have some 20% porosity. Instead, the, the, from the measurement that the spacecraft that flew, flew through um, uh, Matilde, they estimated that the density was 1.3 gram cubic centimeter. This is a carbonaceous asteroid. And uh, uh, they estimated a 50% porosity. So this means that the internal structure of these two bodies are different. In what sense? The asteroid on the left may be a, a structure more uh, similar to what we would see in an Inca wall if you go to Peru or, or, or Bolivia. While the uh, asteroid on the right is a disordered uh, aggregation of fragments. This is an essential, uh, an essential distinction if you want to, to discriminate between just cracked asteroids and rubble piles. 
Okay, then we have binary asteroids. We have found that binary asteroids exist even in the um, even in the near Earth asteroid population. Uh, in fact, if you look at the records of the of uh, NEA observation, you have that more than fifty percent of of binaries are near Earth asteroids. And uh, that was discovered for the first time in 1993 when Ida was uh, imaged uh, by the Galileo spa spec spacecraft and was found to have a small uh, satellite. Now, um, how do we do? How do we make an as a, 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 a a near Earth binary. Well, there is a there are a couple of theories. One is that the binary formation can can happen by surface shedding and the formation of a uh, the formation of a satellite uh, in orbit. This is possible only if we have a strong cohesive core. This is not the only way to make an asteroid a, a binary asteroid. Binary, binary asteroid we showed uh, a few years ago that may also be the result of uh, the result of a natural uh, gravitational accumulation, which is what I show here in this view graph. The fragments come back together, but uh, the system has enough angular momentum to have one of the largest uh, or one of the fragments to be rotating around uh, the primary, and this is, may. Uh, lead to a different uh, structure for the for the satellite. In this case, we will have a satellite that is a monolithic body instead in the other ways of uh, producing uh, satellites by mass shedding, they would be uh, themselves gravitational aggregates made by small chunks coming out of the of the spinning uh, primary. Okay, I think it's time for a summary now because be, before going to the uh, numerical uh, part of the of the talk, and uh, let's see what is the uh, how asteroid collisional history. So uh, we have a primordial formation phase where we can have low speed accreting collisions that clump together. Um, protoplanets by gravitational instability, and maybe, maybe we can also have gravel or sand piles of, of small size. Then from that we form planetesimals. Planetesimals go through collisional evolution uh, when they are in the in the asteroid belt due to, to the high speed uh, uh, collisions. So they undergo either high speed collision, either multiple low energy collisions, and out from that we can have a a whole range of different outcomes. From the multiple, multiple low energy collision, we can have cracked bodies with low macroporosity. From the high speed shattering collision, we can have from single fragments to binary asteroids to gravitational aggregates. And then the story goes on again, because in the, in the, in the asteroid belt collisions go on, so cracked body may become gravitational aggregates. Gravitational aggregates may undergo different, uh, uh, many cycles of uh, uh, shattering and reaccumulation, so creating second and third generation of uh, gravitational aggregates. And some of the gravitational aggregates can be spin up by, by the YORP effect, which is a non-gravitational effect spinning up or down uh, asteroids. And they may end up at, as uh, near-Earth asteroid uh, binaries, or if the uh, spin up is too much, they may end up as single fragments going into the uh, super fast rotator population. So, how do can we uh, model numerically uh, the internal structure of of asteroids? Okay, there are many different ways to to do that, and I will try to summarize some of them and how the thing has been evolving up to up to our days. So uh, the first uh, goal is to try with the classical spherical cow approximation, which is taking spherical components, making monodispersed distributions. And this is what has been done in uh, many uh, numerical models. Uh, um, Schwarz in 
2012 uh, set up a soft, soft sphere discrete element method for n body um, n body uh, coding that is called pkd graph and zhang uh, et al in 2018 and in a number of other papers uh, they studied what is the what are the conditions under which um, a gravitational aggregate made by single particles uh, spherical particles can withstand uh, spin up and they uh, found that uh, in order to withstand spin up they need uh, to have cohesion uh, and when i say cohesion i mean um, van der waals forces intermolecular forces between those particles in order to make these uh, these objects stiff enough to withstand the uh, spin up process uh, again, uh, there is a, another another code made by by Paul Sanchez in 2014. Um, it's simply a, a, a soft, sphere, soft sphere discrete element model. Again, they assume that particles must have some level of cohesion in order to withstand uh, spin up, and they can make they can have very many different outcomes depending on the initial condition that may go from the formation of a of a um, of a binary or uh, equal size binary by fission to the formation of satellites by mass shedding and finally hirabayashi and, and hirabayashi and shears in 2015 uh, set up a finite element model based on the commercial package and uh, they studied again um, they studied again what are the conditions under which uh, we can have uh, uh, spin up and uh, final products from that spin up and depending on what is the uh, on what is the um, the internal strength they find different outcomes essentially they find that if the interior is a strong one then you can have mass shedding and the object can can survive otherwise the object may either be uh, destroyed or produce uh, or produce a structure that we actually don't see in the between asteroids all right so all these models are based on the uh, Call the discrete element method uh, for for uh, interaction of, of particles that uh, includes a, a, some level of uh, overlapping between the uh, elementary constituent uh, um, elements that are um, that are spheres, so they can have a, a reaction between. Uh, those spheres due to the overlapping, they can take into account, into account friction, all kinds of friction, including uh, sliding friction, rolling friction, uh, twisting friction. Um, okay, uh, as, I, as I commented before, uh, in order for some models to uh, really accomplish for what uh, we observe they have to take into account the fact that there may be cohesion between particles these particles that you see here apart from their contact forces due to their interaction they can have um, that are the interaction when they touch each other they can have uh, van der Waals forces that if you go to the uh, small gravity, gravity regime, they, they may become larger than the gravitational force between the particles. This is something, something that is not very intuitive, but we have some examples on Earth. If you take flour or if you take uh, uh, cocoa, for instance, and you put it in a vacuum chamber to take away air and humidity, then you see that if you shake it, they may form clumps those clumps are not due any longer to uh, humidity they are due to the fact that uh, the van der Waal forces at this very very small size of the particles that they are making this this uh, uh, this material are overcoming the gravitational force on earth and they form clumps now the hypothesis of this study is that they uh, they, they claim that this is possible uh, for larger particles, for centimeter-sized particles, when the, uh, when the uh, gravitational force is very small, like in the case of an asteroid. We don't know if this is true or not. Uh, the, the mission, um, the Hayabusa mission, uh, 
to uh, Hayabusa 2 mission to Ryugu hasn't found any evidence of cohesion, at least on the surface of uh, Ryugu. All right, so um, on the other hand, there are um, granular matter physics studies that are very interesting because they relate the um, angularity of the particles with the coefficient of friction. And on the other side, they uh, relate this angularity of fragments with the shear uh, strength of the material. And they find that the shear strength of material for angular particles may be up to twice the shear strength um, when, when uh, you have spherical particles. So this is something that is, has to be taken into account, into account. That is, angular particles increase macroscopic friction and they may lead to larger uh, shear stress. And they, this can uh, have a consequence that, that, that is that we need to use realistic fragment shapes uh, in order to um, account for the real effect of friction. And in this way, maybe we can read, we, we can get rid of the need of the van der Waal cohesion forces that hasn't found any evidence on the uh, missions that have been uh, run to now. So maybe we can go a step forward and improve a little bit our model and making non-spherical components so that we can make a and, and we can also make realistic size distributions for components. There is a, there is a model made by uh, Ferrari and Tanga in 2020 called the Grains Discrete Element Model, which includes a package called uh, Chrono that uh, makes uh, polyhedra instead of spheres. And in this way, without the use, uh, the need of using uh, cohesion, they manage to uh, reproduce uh, the stiffness of, the, of some of the uh, span up asteroid that we observe today, only including a stiff core. That is a, a core with large fragments that can have large uh, friction in between them. Now, uh, what is our contribution, the contribution of our group to this, to this study? So uh, we started a few, uh, a few years ago in trying to uh, understand what is the effect of having non-spherical shapes of the uh, components of a gravitational aggregate. So we took the uh, set of, sets of experiments that we performed at the NASA Ames Vertical Gun Range in 2013, 13, uh, from which we, we derive the mass spectra and the shapes of the object, and, and we try to, um, and the, the, the paper is, is published in Planetary and Space Science, and this is the, the plot that I show you uh, before, and we try to take from that uh, shapes of the gravitational aggregates uh, using the PKD Grav soft sphere discrete element method to build them. So we have a matrix sphere from which we can extract any kind of shapes, any kind of fragments, and uh, we distribute them in space in a random way. And here you have you see all the different shape of the fragments that are essentially ellipsoids. At that time, we haven't anything better than that. The colors represent different mass uh, ranges. So this that was our our model at uh, at the time uh, to. Uh, uh, up to two, two years ago, from which we can uh, we can uh, simulate what is the process of uh, reaccumulation of asteroids, setting the components in Spain with random overall angular momentum, velocity, and uh, and position, and allow for collisional evolution to reaccumulation. From that, we were able to measure the bulk volume and the porosity with the with the with the given error. And we found that our uh, simulations were um, were in agreement, uh, at least for the S-type asteroid case, with the uh, estimations from uh, putting together all the available estimations of the uh, porosity for asteroids. Um, 
that Curry uh, put together uh, ten, 10 years ago. So within error bars, we are in agreement with that. So it is, this was encouraging. And we also derived um, um, a relationship, a loose relationship between the porosity and the size of the largest fragment that is formed in the, in the fragmentation, in the collision. In this way, we were able to form uh, many kind, many many uh, shapes of asteroids that are uh, in agreement. As you can see here in, in the plot on the right, the, the the stars are observed asteroids. The shape of observed, of observed asteroids uh, described by the uh, B over A and C over A uh, axis ratios, and the the, the black uh, the, the the blue and and, and red dots are the, uh, our results for S-type and C-type uh, uh, aggregates. So uh, I think this was an, encourage, an encouraging start for our, for our study. All right, uh, we um, were also able to reproduce some of the strange things, uh, strange uh, uh, shapes that we may find find in the asteroid population. That is, for instance, the uh, contact binaries. Here we have the case of Itokawa that it was found to have, for the best fit to all observations, two different densities for the body and for the head, essentially. And here we have what we have for our uh, simulations, which is a similar, similar, um, similar estimations. And uh, the most, I think, the most relevant thing is that we envisioned a, a, a mechanism to form uh, these binary asteroids. Essentially, what happens is that in the reaccumulation, in the uh, reaccumulation process. Um, some of the fragments that are close to the largest fragment push it out of the center, and this largest fragment ends up as the as the head of the uh, of the contact binary that we have at the end of the of the simulation. And if we compare the two shapes, we have very very promising uh, match between the, our simulations and observation of Itokawa. All right. So, from a from a general point of view, uh, we could conclude that the largest fragment uh, final position is not necessarily in the code of the accumulated asteroid uh, structure, and this may explain some of the uh, shapes that we find in the solar system. That we have many many uh, contact binaries, uh, as you can see here, from Itokawa to Tutatis uh, comets, some of the comets, uh, uh, 67P, Arrokot. Uh, so uh, what we put forward is that their structure may just be the natural outcome of the accumulation process. All right, but we were not uh, happy with that because still we didn't have uh, um, we didn't have uh, realistic shapes for our components, so we started a new, a new, uh, we started a new research, and we we wanted to go from spherical particles to ellipsoidal components to realistic shapes, and we uh, set up a, a pipeline that we named the Shakespeare, which is shattering experiments to synthetic shapes through photogrammetry, and this is, uh, in, uh, in fact, what uh, what we did. We can take the experiments that we have of any other set of experiments, and out of them, we can do photogrammetry on each of the fragments that we have, that is making a lot of pictures for, from many different angles, and then translate them to, uh, translate them to to shape models like you see in this view graph here you have the 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 photogram the the the, the pictures the picture taken and through photogrammetry we are able to to build um, to build uh, any kind of of uh, uh, of those of those fragments and we can change their their uh, relative scale and we can scale to whatever we like to asteroid sizes or whatever so from there, the last steps, passing from the picture of, uh, of single fragments to the shape model, is to go to the, um, to extract from the Piketty graph model, extract uh, a rigid aggregate with the shape of these objects so that we can have any kind of, of shape. And at the end, we put them in space at random with 
uh, arbitrary uh, initial conditions and we, we can make them uh, evolve until they uh, collapse into a gravitational aggregate uh, by means of the program uh, PKT. And now we, we can have more realistic uh, representation of what are, of what are the, the shapes of the asteroids. And uh, from, from there, what we want to do is to measure what is the porosity that we have. This is something to be done in the next uh, future to try to understand if we have a better match with respect to the case in which we use the, the uh, ellipsoids. Okay, just to finish is, uh, I, will, I, I wish just to mention what missions are planned or have been done to unveil the uh, structure of small bodies. As you well know, the comet uh, 67P was visited by Rosetta and uh, they performed high frequency radar uh, experiments to uh, understand uh, the, its uh, surface structure. That was the first exam example of, the, uh, of uh, using spacecraft to measure the internal structure. Here we are really entering a new era in, we, in which uh, we will be able to know really what is the internal structure of, of asteroids. And going to the future, uh, the mission HERA will uh, use gravimeter to measure the gravity field and from, and from that, uh, try to um, try to deduce what is the uh, internal distribution of mass and uh, radar and radio measurements of both Didymos and Dimorphos that will be able to uh, uh, will be able to uh, inspect what is the uh, internal distribution internal structure of Dimorphos and the internal structure of at least as uh, half of the mass of uh, of Didymos. Okay, uh, this is all, and uh, here is the the summary. We have evidence for gravitational aggregates. The small asteroid structure is depending on size. The component size distribution is unknown until now, and we all can only have clues from laboratory experiments and SPH simulations. The post-catastrophic impact gravitational reaccumulation leads to reproduce numerically some asteroid shapes. Binary systems may provide useful information because they are, uh, they, we may relate structure to the formation mechanism. And uh, that's for sure that we see on-site spacecraft measurement uh, in the future. Okay, and this is uh, all for me. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh was uh, Campo Pacatin, uh, very, very, very comprehensive and uh, uh, talk describing a, a, a series of very complicated cal computations. And I do hope that uh, Bo Yan Liu can learn 10% of what you have been doing. <laughs> 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 Make sure that he, he, he does. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm, I'm, sure. not, I'm not going to let him come back to Taiwan. <laughs> Uh, so, any questions? Uh, questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. uh, if not, uh, no, if, uh, uh, when we are waiting, I have a couple of questions to ask you, Adreno. Firstly, you know, you mentioned that there's no sign of cohesion uh, observed on on Lugo. Uh, why did you say that? Uh, yes, um, from the um, from one of the experiments that they made. Uh, uh, impacting a small bullet on the surface, uh, the way in which uh, material has moved on the surface uh, led the, the the researchers that that studied what what is the, 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 the what was the distribution of such of such uh, motion of particles led to the conclusion that uh, uh, no cohesion was acting in the motion of these of these particles. They also didn't find new clumps of mm. particles so that they they could be uh, they have been formed by the motion of this of this particle. Something similar was found uh, by the Osiris Rex uh, uh, mission when they make their uh, uh, the collection of the samples that they are taking back to Earth, and from the motion of the of the particles on the surface, they concluded that they don't expect uh, cohesion on the surface. We don't know if 
the, if the situation is different uh, below the surface. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, Wendy, Wendy Chen has a question. Do you want to ask uh, yourself? Wendy? Uh, hi, uh, the basic company is Wendy. So I have one question. Uh, so will gravitational aggression produce the uniform porosity or the, uh, the porosity just case by case? I'm not sure I, I understand the, the question. Can you uh, repeat I'm, it? Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, all the asteroids uh, from the rubble pie or from the gravitational aggregates. So do they have the uniform porosity or just by case by case? Ah, I see. Thank you for the question. Um, it depends, uh, as I try to, to show, it depends on their uh, composition. They may have different, at least bulk porosity. Uh, bulk porosity is the sum of the micro porosity, which is the porosity as small, small scale, and the uh, macro porosity, which is the porosity due to the voids. So, uh, for instance, C types show up to 40% of porosity altogether. So, from what we know, it looks like that most of the porosity must be in inside each of the fragments. So um, there are two different two different cases. One case is depending on the composition. If there are C types or S types, they can have different porosities, average porosities. And then for the same case, a same a same uh, kind of. Uh, of asteroids, same composition, for instance, an S type, you can have a whole range of different porosities. Then the the average of those porosities you find to be around 30%, 25 to 30% or something like that. But but you can have asteroids that have low porosity, macro porosity, like asteroid, uh, asteroid Eros, because they are just cracked and fragments have not moved very much. Or you can have very high porosities uh, due to the fact that all the fragments are uh, are jam, jam, uh, jumbled in, in, inside the in the, the whole structure, so you can go from maybe twenty percent to forty percent in an S-type asteroid, for instance, for the macro porosity. It depends on its formation. On average, you have something around thirty percent, according to available estimations. But, but that's the question, because if you have the uh, uh, range of porosity from 20% to 40%, how come that they all end up having the same uh, spin cut off? So you mean... Uh, I mean, what from, is... from, from one kilometer to 10 kilometer or 20 kilometer, uh, and for S-type, you can see that they have a very, very, almost a, the same spin cut off, same, you know, chemical, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but as you said, they have a range of porosity from twenty to forty percent. Yes. Well, um, from 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 the work that has been done on this on this topic, uh, I think that porosity itself it's not the the leading parameter for the for the uh, uh, that keeps together uh, these bodies. These bodies are mostly kept together by friction forces and 2.2 uh, 2.1 to 2.2 is a limit that is uh, for the s type asteroid if you go to the c type asteroid the limit is even even below is around three true yeah yeah because because this depends on density of course yeah. and and it depends on what is the uh, the friction and cohesion if there is cohesion between between fragments, and it is, uh, for some reason, it is uh, an experimental evidence that friction is not able to withstand uh, uh, shear stresses beyond uh, beyond two point two, uh, two point one to two point two. Uh, oh, okay. Um, all right. So I I, I still no, don't quite understand it, but I will ask you uh, some other time. Uh, I can see that uh, Lin Chi Hong you, you, uh, has raised a hand. Uh, Chi Hong, can you ask the question? 
Okay, yeah. So um, the fact that I have two questions is the uh, first one is that because just like you said, one asteroid in nine B is just made by the different lines of the rock. They bind to each other to become a long asteroid. So my question is, uh, is that possible that this asteroid B, the A point, this is a heavier, they have more mass. The B point, this is a very good uh, high porosity. So when that happens, in theory, this asteroid they will have unbalanced center of gravity. So how this so will they change the um, position of the rotate axis uh, in this uh, asteroid surface? So this is the first question. Um, I'm not sure I, 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 I got the question completely. Can, can, yeah. can, yeah. you, can you say it in a simple way, uh, Lin Chi Hong? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, so, so just like, uh, for example, they have the two asteroids, the this part, this is the heavier, and this part, this is the lighter. So heavier, in theory, will be has a stronger gravity, and um, the center of the gravity, this is the closer for this and heavier place. So how this asteroid will be, there will be uh, maybe they are the, the normal uh, rotor axis is in the metal, but maybe this part also is that well, their rotor axis um, become right, uh, turn right because uh, closer for a heavier area. Oh, oh yeah, so my, it's very good. Still not easy, huh? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Very uh, why, why don't you you know <laughs> I think you why don't you write it down and, and, and send to me and I, I forward it to Professor uh, um Campo Pagarin for you and uh, let him look at the questions because uh, uh yeah. all right. All right. Yeah, I think this is so yeah. you you're, you're thank you thank you better you 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 have better luck <laughs> second. Mm. All right, so okay, I, I will just to keep the second question. So my second question is that because uh, we know after they are rotating, so we have equatorial around their polar area. So my question is that every asteroid has to do is self escape speed. I maybe this asteroid is is uh, one meter per second can be escaped from this asteroid. So my question is that because in the equatorial area, this the part they are rotating faster. So it will be has a more centrifugal uh, force. Yeah, so. Well, this uh, different era in asteroid surface will be has a uh, different escape speed. I mean, in the equatorial, the escape speed is uh, um, smaller, but in the polar area, this is a no centrifugal force, so this part escape speed will be um, higher. So, uh, yes, you, what you say is it's true. I mean, it's uh, the, 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 when the, an asteroid is spinning, the, the, the the local acceleration close to the equatorial area is smaller and it, in if the asteroid is spinning faster it may come to a point where where the material is going is going out into into space and this doesn't happen in, in the polar area okay and uh, okay and and from that uh, that consideration is 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 correct of course and uh, from that, what was exactly that you wanted to say to to know? I mean, what he meant was that uh, the question is whether the asteroid at the equatorial region uh, there's a larger centrifugal force at, at the polar region uh, where you don't, and that that actually this effect has shown up in some of the small asteroids. They have a, a kind of uh, diamond shape, right, uh, Adriano? Yes. Right. Yes. And they like like this, and that is because of the you know because of this uh, this effect. Yes. Uh, right. And I think that the uh, Professor uh, 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 Campbell Bagatti might have already done some experiments showing that uh, the shape changing because of the rotation of the you know of the of the of the asteroid, which is a rubble pie structure. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, uh, this is we observe that, and this is uh, there are already many papers published in the literature that mm -hmm. show that okay, the, the sort of equilibrium shape is this diamond shape. But mm -hmm. I don't know what what is the 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 question. I I I didn't get what is what was the question because this is something that we that we know already. I don't know if there is was a question beyond that. 
So can you repeat the question again? Uh, okay, so my, my second question is, I mean, um, it's a, it's a, oh, it's just a little hard to describe, but anyway, so this image is about a one a perfect round after, because that is easy to describe, a perfect round after. So the equatorial is the A point, and the polar area this is the B point. So just mm -hmm. think about if this asteroid is going to rotate, it escapes to be a one meter per second. But because they are used to uh, uh, one, the speed they are rotating, and their equatorial mobility has a stronger centrifugal force. So, will equatorial areas if be dropped down to the maybe 30 centimeters per second, the polar area still keeps one meter per second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is my question. <laughs> Still, I, I don't get it. Also, because there is a strong echo, there is a strong echo coming into the microphone, so it it, it is difficult to to get what exactly uh, the words are. So I can't okay. I can't really hear correctly. So maybe you, you can. I, I I will I will ask you to write the questions down and just send an email to me so that I can I can be back to you and, and try to right. answer if I if yeah. I have an answer. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so so good. Let's do that. I, I will give you a link to your email email uh, yes email sure address. Yeah. So finally I want to ask you yourself a question. You know, what is the final what is the still you know question still to be solved from your point of view? What? No, I'm I'm asking Professor <laughs> Kambuk for God. Yeah. <laughs> not, not <asking> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if there is a question to be solved, yes, there is. A, of course, there is the the the, the big question of uh, how uh, really um, binary asteroids form, because now there are uh, hypotheses on their formation based on models that are very very basic. So it's a uh, try. Uh, it, it would be important to to confirm what happens when we spin up a, a rubble pile with no cohesion and uh, friction forces uh, at to the point that it begins to to shed the to shed mass this is one of the of the most uh, interesting uh, questions to uh, to answer and uh, one of the uh, interesting questions to answer is also what we observe in the in Ryugu and Bennu uh, top shape asteroids that is that there is an excess of uh, of uh, crater-like features on the equatorial region, and there is not so many uh, at other latitudes, and also the distribution of boulders is not uh, even. So this is something that we we need to understand, and I think that may help uh, also understanding what is the what what are the mechanisms that make. Uh, uh, then make mass move on the surface of, of those bodies, and that may be related to the internal structure. Maybe discriminating if the if the if the structure is more or less uh, stiff. Right. Well, okay. Yeah. In fact, uh, even the the stiffness of the of the of the of the materials could have a distribution. You know, they need not be uniform. Uh, right. Yeah, right. So it's, it's pretty complicated. Okay, thank you, yeah. uh, 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 Adriano. I think it's, uh, uh, I'm so happy that you, you know, you're able to finally, I, I, I can hear your seminar uh, after so many years. Uh, and the, I hope that uh, uh, you will be able to come to visit Taiwan uh, soon. I hope so. Uh, yeah, right. And, uh, and, uh, and try to try to um, teach uh, Oh, well, yeah, and you as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very, very hard worker. So I've been hard working as a young person. So he's able to, to learn something from you. And thank sure. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Yeah. thank you again for inviting me. And uh, and please give give my email to, to your student so that he can Certainly. ask uh, questions. Certainly. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. OK, bye thank bye. you again. Bye-bye. Good day. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye to everyone.